simply just tremendous. Repellent. Happy Sunday and welcome to the Macro Sunday podcast. My name is Andreas Steno. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Steno Research, your independent macro research shop. Uh, and I'm joined by Emil Müller. Yep. Hi. Our, our head of research um, for uh, this podcast. And we're joined by Michael Cow in 10 minutes time yep. to discuss everything related to the Chinese Wang. Yeah. Uh, Michael is a former Goldman trader, um, but also the uh, chief investment officer of, of um, Acanthus Capital. So both a, a strong career on the sell side on and on the buy side and with a strong knowledge on China. And obviously, nearly everything has been about China this week. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we've scarcely talking about anything else, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, is the, that is the short version. Yeah. Um, remember that uh, this is the independent macro podcast out there. And towards the end of the show, we try to become as concrete as we can uh, by um, giving you an insight into our 100% transparent portfolio. Yeah. And we probably need to disclaim, especially this week, that <laughs> our trade ideas might be... <laughs> sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. <laughs> sometimes maybe shit. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that In the rubble. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> But Emil... Um, You're obviously following the trends in emerging markets yeah. and China in particular at this yeah. juncture. Yeah. Um, before we get to the structural discussion on China, we'll take the discussion on the on the short term outlook with Michael and uh, on, on on the exchange rate, etc. I'd like to show <laughs> a um, a clip from a Donald Trump rally yeah. just after COVID 19 Did anybody see my speech the other night on Saturday night? Yeah. So, what I said the other night, there's never been anything where they have so many names. I could give you 19 or 20 names for that, right? It's got all different names. Wuhan. Now, Wuhan was catching on. <laughs> Coronavirus, right? Kung flu. Yeah. <laughs> Kung flu. COVID. COVID-19. COVID. Yeah, Kung flu. I think yeah. that's the best uh, version of it. Emil, got to the reason it. why I, I wanted to play this soundbite in this um, video clip uh, is that it may be fair to say that the Chinese economy is simply suffering from long COVID. Yeah, yeah, in different aspects, mm -hmm. right? So uh, on one hand, they haven't really supported consumers, right? Even though they locked everyone down and um, and uh, let them out again, they didn't have that much uh, excess spend, ex excess saving to to go uh, to go uh, to go spending on. Um, that's that's one side of the story. Another side of the story is that um, well, the the industrial complex hasn't really been catching on to the extent that we sort of expected. At least for, for on on my own account here, I thought they would. Um, That would come out come out on all guns blazing um, mm. and really start to be offensive as you know uh, the manufacturing uh, really has has caught tailwinds across the globe and really like a short space of time mm. from when uh, from when uh, COVID ended, if you like. Um, so yeah, they um, and now they're in a balance sheet recession. That's basically my my take on it. They're then then real trouble due to the entire real estate complex. Yeah, I mean. I I had a look at some uh, vacancy data uh, mm. from from large Chinese cities. Yeah, um, I think there was 27 million square meters of vacant apartments in mm. Beijing right now. Yeah, and that is up 10 million mm. <laughs> square meters in just a few years, right? Yeah. Um, they're about yeah. uh, and th almost one way traffic right now. Yeah. Um, What can they do about the situation, Emil, if we look at it on a structural basis? Well, um, well, <laughs> the problem is structural, mm. and the only solutions they have are, you know, temporary liquidity measures, basically. Unless they want to, on one hand, easen 
the pain, they will also oh. add to the add fuel to the fire. That's the problem, and um, that's why I think they're largely jawboning, and you know they can't really find a footing. And all the policy measures they keep adapting are essentially just incoherent, right? Uh, cutting rates on one hand and intervening to defend the Wang on the other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> that's that's so. Um, essentially, I think what they what they really have to do is at least to 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 find a floor for the real estate sector and really back it. Yeah. And that's easier said than done. Um but right now everyone's operating under this the assumption that their real estate, their apartment uh, is going to decline in price in future and that's just a deflationary dead spiral essentially. Yeah. So yeah, plenty of trouble. <laughs> Indeed. Uh and we still see a uh, an ongoing uh, deleveraging in um in households. Yeah. Um, in sharp contrast to the manufacturing sector, as you mentioned. Yeah, that's what they're picking up, right? There yeah. are plenty of incentive schemes to keep up the, the trade surplus. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, and now that's, you know, the demand on that side is starting to uh, to catch some headwinds. So, uh, so I mean, with that, say, 10, 20-year <laughs> yeah. horizon, <laughs> any reasons to belong to China at all? Not really. No. No, no. no. I mean, if and especially if you're invested in in some illiquid asset, real estate, of course, being the obvious one, but mm. uh, being some private equity or something, you know, phew, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bai Hong Shi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that, that, that is the yeah. sole sort yeah. of yeah. Uh, glimpse of light at the end of the tunnel that I can see. Uh, yeah, at, absolutely. at least we see pretty decent, uh, a pretty decent acceleration in the export of, of um, passenger cars. Yeah. Uh, and, Impressively, Germany is not even uh, no. delivering one single sub component to these uh, EVs from no. China. It doesn't seem like it. Okay. Least, uh, okay. I'm not the the only thing that sort of has me question whether that's you know my my negligence of of the of the of the of the of uh, China going forward is they really know how to implement industrial policy. Mm. They have an actual track record uh, in recent decades, unlike most, uh, like unlike the US and and the eurozone in particular, right? Yeah. But right now, if you if you buy a car, but you know, I don't know if you've been uh, EV hunting. But I've been I've been looking a bit these past weeks, and uh, you can't really come up with any qualitative reason as to why you should pick a Western EV. Uh, It's you know it's relative to a Hongxi. Yeah, okay. I mean it's 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 more expensive. It it doesn't have as much uh, hardware, and it's just technologically behind. I mean, and you pay a lot except more for, for the it. Tesla, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could argue yeah. they're not that big usually. So no, no. if you have three kits or two, yeah. <laughs> two as I do, and and the third one coming up, you know. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's why I'm. Um, You know, I, I I still prefer driving German gasoline cars, <laughs> uh, and I'm I'm not sure I am uh, able to stick with that view for my uh, for the rest of my life. But uh, let's see. Yeah. For now, um, I mean, it's yeah, that's just, it's just much more reliable, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No doubt. I'm a boomer in that sense. <laughs> um, Emil, mm. let's invite Michael Cow to join us uh, here at the Macro Sunday podcast. Yeah. Um, Michael. Uh, is actively involved in commodity trading, um, but also actively involved in uh, in assessing the Chinese yuan trends. Mm. And I think it's very, very critical whether, whether that 730 handle in dollar yuan holds here. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've had a few test of, uh, tests of it all already, um, but it seems like the authorities have sort of managed to contain the pressures for now, yeah. at least. Yeah. But uh, will they be able to defy gravity? Uh, let's bring on Michael Kale to discuss that. And um, as per usual, we introduce our guest of the week with a piece of music. Yeah. And since we're talking about the Chinese uh, Wang, why don't we listen to a um, a small propaganda soundbite called "Red Sun in the Sky." Yeah. 
It is now our great pleasure to introduce Michael Cal to Macro Sunday, former Goldman Sachs, uh, Acanthos Capital Management, and now Cal Family Office. Uh, Michael, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Michael, we are recording hot on the heels of a uh, week with a lot of focus on China. Um, and if we watch the most recent price action in the dollar versus the yuan, um, it seems like there's sort of a talk of war going around that 730 handle. So what do you make of that level and the uh, importance of that level for global markets? Yeah, I've been uh, beating on this uh, drum for a while, as you probably know, back in during the regional banking crisis in March. I wrote a thread called uh, "Ball in a China Shop," meaning the U.S. dollar wrecking ball, and that, and that, uh, at that point, I think the the yuan exchange rate was around like six eighty five or something like that. And I said, "Look, I think I think China's got real economic problems." You know, back in in uh, at the end of last year, I basically said that the reopening one point uh, was likely to be a dud. But now, uh, what's interesting is that lately, this there, there were hopes of like a second sort of reopening, and that's not only uh, proved to be a dud; it's uh, gone the other way. Like the 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 breadth of uh, the China economic collapse is actually kind of mind boggling. So, anyways, um, th- that seems to have come to the forefront now. But I I posted back in March that I felt that between all of the hidden debt on China's balance sheet. Um, and it's it's very, very different response uh, to COVID, uh, coupled with all of its longer term structural uh, demographic problems would at, at some point come to a head and prove very, very deflationary for the world. And so here we are, we're at the essentially October of 22 lows in the yuan, and I do to answer your question. I do believe this 735 level is a very crucial psychological level. It, I've actually become a little bit cautious here. I've uh, I've per- in the name of full disclosure, I've been uh, short the yuan from around 688 to around 725. I got I missed this last little leg up because I think that as we approach this what I'll call the intervention zone. Um, I think chances are that the PBOC or PBOC is, is going to defend this level to prevent uh, a, the psychology, the negative psychology of a disorderly devaluation from taking hold. Um, um, That said, when I, when I made that swap and I tweeted about it, I said that, uh, I think the interesting way to continue with the tail hedge is to go back into the to go into the Hong Kong dollar, because mm-hmm. to me, at at the end of the day, in a tail situation, the two are inextricably joined at the hip. The Hong Kong dollar, as you know, has been um, hard pegged to a band of seven seventy five and seven eighty five for forty years. But it's a very uh, anachronistic peg. And about a month ago, you saw that the overnight high bore, which is their equivalent of Fed funds, essentially, got jacked up to five and three quarters to basically stave off speculate, speculators from betting against the peg. Interestingly, in the last um, week or two weeks, you've seen that overnight high bore back all the way down to three and a quarter, right? So I don't know exactly uh, what that means, whether it means that, you know, they are uh, relaxing their defense uh, on that side because they got they got uh, issues with uh, defending uh, the Chinese yuan or 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 maybe it's because, uh, look, the we all know the issues with Country Garden on uh, on the back of Evergrande a couple of years ago. And it's the the Scylla Charybdis analogy that I've been writing about is is the one where, you know, if you, if if China has a strong yuan, um, it is very defeatist for them trying to revive their export driven economy. Um, and 
if they have a weak yuan as a result of uh, uh, monetary uh, stimulus, which is necessary to resuscitate their pro- property sector, it potentially causes them other issues like uh, commodity price inflation, right? Since they're importing about 80, 85% of their oil, which is dollar denominated. But the reason why I felt that they would air towards the weaker yuan a couple of months ago was that you saw oil oils collapse earlier this year. I felt that all things being equal, the Scylla monster of weaker yuan would seem that much more palatable, right, to, to the PBOC. Now we're at this crucial juncture. So, you know, I, 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 I think they're still very much in a quandary. I, I feel that the PBOC and HKMA are what you're seeing right now is a little bit of deer in the headlights. Um, they tried to intervene when, uh, when, when the yuan hit around 722. They intervened very, very aggressively, if you remember, and took it down to 711. And then now uh, it's that, that it's gone up to like 735, there's a little bit of a dare in the headlights mentality, but I feel like they, they need to prevent a disorderly situation from happening if they can. Hmm. And so that's, that's, the, that's the key question. Um, but, but again, it's only going to be a Band-Aid because for them to really revitalize their economy, they need to stimulate. And... Um, uh, the, the the conundrum that China is facing is the same conundrum that a lot of central banks around the world is facing are facing, which is everybody is hoping upon hope that the Fed is going to finally blink and stop its hiking cycle or at least start to ease, right? But the problem facing the entire world and especially China is the strength of the U.S. consumer. The strength of the U.S. consumer just doesn't seem to let up and therefore it doesn't allow the Fed to let up. And so um, anything, any, anything stimulative that China does is going to inherently weaken its currency. So they're, they're, they're fighting a losing battle here, in my opinion. Mm. Is it even possible for the People's Bank of China to sort of defy gravity for the for the yuan here? If we look at rate spreads, for example, Michael, we're back to 2007 uh, spreads between dollar and, and, and uh, yuan rates. And back at the time, we traded above 7.75 in dollar yuan. So are they fighting an impossible battle here? It's, it's pretty, I mean, look. I wrote a I wrote a thread I don't know about a month ago I called it the Ivan Drago Fed in a in a call back to Rocky IV. You might be too young to remember that movie, but uh, if you remember right, there's this huge <laughs> Russian guy goes to Rocky. I must break you. So to me, right, that's the Fed. Fed the Fed is Ivan Drago, and it's basically saying to the world or to the U.S. labor market, I must break you. I I think the Fed it, because of the strength of the u.s consumer one of two one of two things is going to break or both either the u.s labor market or a more economically frail uh economy like china that's heavily heavily indebted and we're seeing it happen in real time in china already um but um i i tweeted out this morning i said you know let the outdubbing of the fed begin because Asia never stopped out dubbing, right? With uh, between Japan and China, um, you're now seeing Latin America start to cry uncle and start to slash uh, rates. And I actually think that perhaps the next shoe to fall in terms of uh, out dubbing is going to be the ECB. Mm. I'm curious yeah. what you think of that, given given where where you're situated. What do you what do you think of that? I think that's a very fair assumption. Yeah. Um, we, we've had the discussion internally here whether the deflation that we see in China will actually spill over to a large extent to the European inflation basket mm-hmm. relative to the US. And I think that's a feasible assumption by now. Um, also, given that trade ties between the US and China, um, at least direct trade ties, have faded quite materially over the past three mm-hmm. years. Um, if you look at, at the um, percent of goods imported from, from China relative to the rest of the world, I think we're down to 13%. Something like that. They're about in the US now from more than 20, uh, just a few years ago. 
I know that some of these trade flows are redirected via Brazil, Mexico, etc. Uh, so, Mexico in particular. Yeah, yeah. Um, to avoid tariffs. But in any case, the goods deflation is not as crystal clear uh, in the US as it would have been a few years back. Michael, the oil market is obviously an important source of volatility in the yuan as well it seems at this juncture yeah. uh, and when you when you look at the oil price development over the past say six or eight weeks relative to this malaise in chinese economic activity what do you see as the main driving force behind this this spike in oil prices it's not chinese demand is it yeah, I think. Look, I think I as let, let me just in, in the name of full disclosure say that <clears throat> I I've had a long term uh, bull bet on oil uh, since 2018 in the form of a private equity. Right, mm-hmm. um, it's an illiquid position, but I put it on as a very long term, essentially 10 year bet on on oil. That said, starting in April of 22 last year. I became short-term bearish on oil for all all of these macro reasons, and uh, despite the recent rip in commodity prices, um, I think that it's not going to hold. Unfortunately, and that's speaking against my own long-term interest. Mm. I I have been starting to hedge uh, through uh, XOP options, um, but to to me. If you look at the rest of the commodities, uh, industrial commodities, copper, aluminum, steel, for instance, they're all breaking down. They're all on levels of key support and almost directly uh, sort of inversely proportional to uh, dollar yuan, right? Um, And a while ago, um, I, I coined this term, I call it the Chinese yuan oil doom loop. And it's it as the, my issue is that because I see this tremendous uh, uh, headwind to the yuan, um, I see that as very, very deflationary uh, for for the entire world, but in particular to pro-cyclical commodities, because mm-hmm. look, it's it's a dollar-based commodity. You're, you're, you're going to see demand destruction. You're seeing it happen in Asia with Japan and China. Um, I think that this commodity strength uh, has to do with two things. One is that it's a we're in a we're in a seasonally strong period to begin with. Number one, um, that's about to ebb. Um, it usually ebbs in the fall and then picks back up probably at, uh, in December. But what I fear is that by the time um, you see the the seasonals rebound again in December, is the same time when we're at least in the U.S. will start to finally see some cracks in unemployment. So, so I'm in the short term. I'm not bullish uh, on oil. I think that, uh, in my mind, you know, f- first first of all, the the risk reward is all screwed up. I think that because OPEC Plus has already cut three times. Uh, and to bring oil to currently where it is, um, they've run out of bullets because uh, Saudis are, are only at 9 million barrels per day now from, from their peak of around, call it 12. There's a lot of forward spare capacity in the system right now. And so to me, I think that precludes a runaway uh, oil price, even if the macro economy uh, was uh, was very vibrant. It is not. I think that a lot of the uh, Chinese demand numbers you see have to do with them stockpiling. Now, mm. there's a lot of there's a lot of opacity around exactly how much product capacity they have and how much SPR capacity they have. They have been stocking up, and you know, uh, people like uh, Kyle Bass would say that that's because they're. They're planning for war, imminent invasion, something like that. It's all po- it's it's all possible, right? It's mm. certainly all possible, but there are mm. limits to how much uh, they're going to uh, of that stocking is going to continue. And certainly at current prices, I would say that the you're going to see that demand elasticity start to kick in as well, mm. right? Mm. Um, so 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 on the upside, I 
the, the, the reason why I think the risk reward for oil is not good here is that the upside, uh, given the, the forward spare capacity prevents a flyaway scenario, but the downside is, well, the downside is what you can, you can see in, in 1998, I've, I've warned, um, a couple of times since last summer that I feel like some of these current these currency crises can take a long time to metastasize, and I note that you know the first wave of currency devaluations in the summer of 1997 preceded the Russian default and the blow up of LTCM by almost 18 months. Yeah. Right. So so we we first saw dollar wrecking ball 1.0 essentially during 2022, beginning of, during during all of 2022. And, you know, we're, we're getting to that point where you're, you're starting to see a resurgence. And the only thing, frank, quite frankly, uh, that's holding the DXY back, DXY is currently at 103.33. The only thing that's really holding the DXY back, as we all know, is really the euro. Because yeah. they, the dollar wrecking ball it has been swinging wildly in Asia already with dollar yen at 146 and Chinese yuan at 730. So... So I think I think it's a it's a scary time to uh, be in pro cyclicals right now. That's my opinion. Mm-hmm. If you look at the potential for a response from the CCP, uh, either via a fiscal package, uh, via a release of strategic petroleum reserves, or mm-hmm. something third. Uh, what do you make of this list of scenarios? What's what's the most likely scenario for, for um, seen from your perspective when it comes to the reaction from the Chinese authorities to this situation? You know, it's it's interesting because I I actually think that they need to have they need to unleash both monetary and fiscal bazookas. But <laughs> whether it's ideological, you know, sort of dogma against uh, against uh, you know. Uh, doing what the West has done in terms of the, our COVID response, or whether it's a sort of deer in the headlights uh, situation, I'm not sure. But their their uh, response has been very very tepid. And what I fear uh, for China, and I guess by by uh, implication the world, is that the the longer they take to combat what looks more and more like a deflationary spiral yeah uh the more uh the more costly the eventual response is going to be because if you think about it like, let's take a thirty thousand foot view for a second and just look at how different the responses were to covid just just to covid mm. in the u.s right we flooded the system with monetary liquidity and with fiscal stimulus to shore up and protect the consumer and that's part of the reason why the the Fed is having such a hard time, uh, uh, you know, getting essentially core uh, inflation down in the U.S. Right? We're still seeing the lingering effects of that liquidity. But if you look at China, uh, they they effectively locked down eighteen months longer than we did, and offered none of that support. If anything, they went the other way, right? Because they had the three red lines policy to curb property speculation, which worked a little bit too well, causing Evergrande and now country, uh, country Garden. I said countrywide. That's a Freudian <laughs> slip. <laughs> <laughs> Smash. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so so it's, it's worked a little bit too well. Um, and now I don't know, I don't, but I don't see them really reversing course. And so Hmm. it's a, it's a weird macro environment because the yuan's continued depreciation suggests that they are going to continue with their monetary stimulus. Right. But, Hmm. but we're we're just seeing it in like little trickles. Hmm. Um, and if they, if they, uh, continue to disappoint, I think that it, that that deflationary pulse will eventually get exported to the rest of the world. And so, when, again, if you go back to what I said earlier with the Ivan Drago Fed analogy in terms of what the Fed is going to break, I think the Fed is going to break one of two things or both, either the U.S. labor market or something fragile in the rest of the world, namely China. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and. And it could very well be that this China implosion 
plays a big part in ultimately what allows the Fed to declare victory. It yeah. could it could very well be. Yeah, makes a lot of sense, Michael. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to discuss this um, interesting theme with you. Um, mm. We'll <laughs> assess the Chinese situation on an ongoing basis in this podcast. Yeah, I think nerves. Uh, yeah, we can rest assured <laughs> that... Um, uh, it's not the last time that we discuss the Chinese real estate market. For, there, there, this year. There's just one, one, yeah. one last point I want to make, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. which is again the, the the scary thing here. Also, is that if you I, I listened to this Odd Lots podcast a while ago uh, with Richard Ku, and you probably yeah. listened to that one, right? Yeah. And and he was comparing China's predicament with uh, with uh, Japan's in the 1990s. And if you remember. The, so the big takeaway for me was that he said that in 1990, Japan's property bubble burst, but it was another 19 years before their demographic, their demographics peaked. If you think about what's happening to China now, their property bubble and their demographics peaked at the same time, basically about two years ago, two or three years ago. So to me, I think about when, when you think about cycles, right, and, this, and the superposition of cycles. In Japan's case, you, you, you had a short-term cycle going down, but they still had a long-term uh, cycle that was still up at the time, you know, 19 years out of phase. Now you've got China where you've got a short-term downturn, but it's now superimposed on, on the long-term downturn at the same time. So, you know, in, in engineering, we call that constructive interference, right? When, when you've got two sinusoidal cycles superimposed upon another and it exacerbates the magnitude of the down cycle so that i think is what we're seeing in china and it, it's very scary because we've honestly i don't think we've ever really seen that uh happen at least not not on this magnitude before yeah no, definitely not yeah absolutely fair point yeah. um <clears throat> michael uh if our audience wants to follow uh your thoughts on a running basis where do they find you <laughs> well i'm i'm at urban cowboy on twitter and then uh, i have a substack urbancowboy.com with a kao so. perfect thank you very much for being with us today michael cow it's, it was a pleasure hosting yeah. you super interesting thanks for having me Back from the interview with uh, Michael Cow, yep. uh, great guy, um, very knowledgeable around uh, both commodities, China and uh, the Yuan. Definitely. And I guess Emil, I mean, our base case has sort of been that the seven thirty handle will, would, would would sort of hold. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the signal from letting that one break is just like too excessive for the for the bullet bureau to really accept mm. that's that's my base case and i also think that it implicitly sort of forces them to actually do reforms internally mm. versus actually just letting the one depreciate mm. so uh, yeah that's that's why i'm on that side of the fence yeah but uh given the discussion here with yeah. michael I, yeah. there are pros and cons of having such a view yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and i i guess when we look at current commodity trends, current portfolio trends mm. of ours, um, it is safe to say that we hope that this 730 handle holds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's been a mixed bag of goodies to be long energy, commodities, mm. etc. with China suffering. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially the part of the bet related to basic materials, industrial metals, etc. suffered big time yeah. um, alongside this focus on country garden, etc. Yeah. So is it a necessity for the commodity view that China rebounds here? I would at least say is it a, yes, that it rebounds to an extent. You don't mm. you don't need an overheating uh, no, no. stimulus package, but yes, you, you need some resilience from China. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And, but I don't think they will necessarily deliver, you know, um, the large scale stimulus, but we will see something. I, I hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. We we ought to remember they delivered four trillion in two thousand and eight. Yeah. Post Lehman, right? Yeah. So they are capable of doing it. Most um, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> but um, a lot of debt to de struggle with internally. Though. Yeah, debt levels are yeah. um, <laughs> well, <laughs> at, at another planet yeah, now yeah, compared yeah, to, to yeah. twin uh, two thousand and eight. Mm. Emil, when we when we talk about the oil market um, mm. and the Chinese link, uh, 
I find it interesting that the oil price has sort of managed to move up without China firing on all cylinders. So is that a supply side story? Partially, yes. Yeah. Yes, I think it's like supply momentum on, on oil is definitely strong at the moment. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's constraining it, right? Mm. So, um, yeah. Um, and another part is, um, which is a bit of a black box, um, the reserves in, uh, in, in China. China. Yeah. 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 <laughs> God knows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, we might see if they really start to, to, uh, to uh, re- refill the stores and what have you, then, you know, you can see a, a decent upside short term. Doubt it, but. So, my. My uh, let me don my tinfoil hat for a yeah, second yeah. here. I am. Um, That's why we're here. <laughs> no one knows whether the Chinese strategic petroleum reserve is full or not. No, no one knows. They do. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. We don't. No. At least. Nope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no one knows that be- it's better than me, right? <laughs> um, my point here is that the available proxies. So, for example, inventories at harbors, mm. uh, retail gasoline inventories, yeah. they're declining. Mm. Mm. And I would be surprised if the trend was the opposite in the yeah. SBR. Yeah. Yeah. Even if a retail uh, gasoline inventory has nothing to do with the SBR. Yeah. But they're, of course, correlated from a demand perspective mm. um yeah and especially now that we've seen a pickup in the oil price i would be very surprised if they yeah. didn't sneak out some barrels of oil out there yeah. but i don't know no uh, but i think it, it sort of speaks into if you really if, you, if you're trading china at this point say say for instance our china china real estate position which has taken a lot of beating right <laughs> um what is it essentially you buy here? You know, you, you, you're you basically long a call of policy intervention. Yeah. You know, and I think that dynamic spills over into the energy market right now. That's why we all focused on China, right? Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really about what, what happens in Beijing. Yeah, I, I, I mean, let's assume that they <laughs> sort of turned back time to July 2020 mm. and rolled back the three red, Lines initiative. Oh yeah. <laughs> then I guess our um, ch- Chinese real estate position would gain a hundred percent in a month or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. Given yeah. how bombed out the sentiment is. Yeah. Um, By I, the bottom. I, 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 I at least <laughs> wouldn't rule that out it in is. case of, of massive policy intervention. Mm. But um, yeah, I think we'll we'll leave it at that for this week, Emil. It, it's it's a tricky juncture, uh, and everything is essentially a bet on the. Politburo. Yeah. 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 Um, I uh, I prefer the casino to this, <laughs> to be yeah, honest. Well, but let's yeah. end on a slightly more hilarious note, at least. Right. I don't know whether it's a positive note. I found a clip um, <laughs> with a uh, couple of stop oil activists uh-huh. making a major and hilarious mistake. <laughs> Climate activists head for an oil terminal on the banks of the Thames in Essex. They are protesters from the controversial Just Stop Oil group. The aim to break in and disrupt operations. Get out, mate, come on. But security is ready. Undeterred, the rest try another route. Eventually, some glue themselves to the wall and are arrested. Our demand is literally just to stop all new licensing and production of fossil fuels. We're not asking for everything to be halted immediately. We know that's not possible. But just we just got to stop it now because it's just only going to get so much worse. Earlier in the day, another group stopped tankers on a busy A road, infuriating drivers. <laughs> One slows to talk, and activists climb on top. Uh, the police will hopefully be here soon, and then you can be on your way in, in like maybe two hours. Two hours? They are unapologetic. <laughs> we have tried with marches, we have tried with petition, petitions. They have not listened to us. 
this has to be the next step and we need to take opportunity of the very small window that we have. Several activists have blocked a road nearby. We know that the vast majority of the British public really care about climate change, but a lot of them are very angry at your methods. Absolutely. If I was in my car, stuck in traffic for this, I'd be cross too. But I, I have five children, and I need to know that there's a future for them. How long are you going to stay here for? Just Stop Oil has been doing this around the country for weeks now. Some local fuel shortages comes the have good part been of reported, right. <laughs> but it's the inconvenience that's too much for some. They stopped all our work. Do you know how much that costs us? What, what, are, what are they achieving? Well, what they're saying is they want maximum disruption to stop the government extracting oil and gas. Yeah, but that's cooking oil. <laughs> they're mental. They're just holding the country to ransom. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has called these activists selfish, fanatical <laughs> and frankly dangerous. And the Labour Party has said there should be an immediate nationwide injunction on their protests. I, I don't think we could end on a better note than this. <laughs> Simply just tremendous. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think we will leave it at that if you for this week. Stay safe yeah. <laughs> if, if you want more of our research instead of research.com, you can use the coupon code MACRO30, uh, MACRO30, uh, to get 30% off your subscription at stenoresearch.com. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Macro Sunday podcast again this Sunday. We'll see you again in a week from now.